Nirvana Dagger. A group of girls use the sword to consecrate a new temple with their own blood. The girl had been betrothed to a local lord on the day of her birth. As she grew, her days were taken up by studying proper bridal technique, while her evenings were spent staring out of her bedroom window and offering prayers for her betrothed to the night sky. Oh my lord, if only you would come to me but a single day sooner. Her home was occupied by several other girls her age. Each one shared the same betrothed and spent her days studying bridal techniques and her evenings praying to the night sky. Oh my lord, if only you would come to me but a single day sooner. One day, a quarrel broke out as the girls argued that only the greatest among them could become the Lord's betrothed. None would yield an inch, each asserting only they alone could possibly satisfy him. Seeing this, their caretaker said in a kind voice, Worry not, girls, each and every one of you shall surely become bride to our Lord. Hearing this, every face lit up in an expression of pure joy. On the day they were to be married, the girls were brought to a place of cobbled stone they could see from the windows of their home. A single dagger was then placed before them, and the girls were told they needed to end their lives here and now if they wished to meet their betrothed. Upon hearing this news, the girls scrambled to seize the dagger from one another, plunging it into their chests the moment they held it. Years later, a temple named the Betrothed was built on the spot where the girls took their own lives. Earthworm's Claw Made from the fossil of an ancient beast, it is more unwieldy than most swords, but further forging can help. An elderly scholar sits in the dim reference room of a moldy museum. Before him lies a single box which had long been sealed away. It is an ancient article the museum previous curator made abundantly clear should never be opened. It is said the box contains a fossil that drinks the blood of humans. What foolishness! One would think we, as people, would have outgrown such nonsense. Only someone who spends all their lives surrounded by books could possibly believe such preposterous superstition. He opens the box, which spits forth a cloud of dust, and beholds a single stone of bizarre shape. Looking at the attached handle, one could easily conclude it was used in some manner of ceremony. However, it could also be viewed as a weapon. And what a fascinating shape! Yes, this will require rigor research indeed. How foolish everyone was to be afraid of something like this. The scholar chuckles softly to himself as he reaches up and gouges out his left eye with the fossil's tip. Axe of Beheading A man's dementia drove him to attack his daughter's fiancé with this axe. Sadly, he hit his daughter instead. There was once a ritual gathering of spirits held on the night of the tenth full moon of the year. During the ceremony, they would gather on the shore of a lake and boast to one another of all the evil deeds they had performed during the year. The first spirit took great joy in telling of the unfathomably cruel way she had killed some of the finest soldiers in the land. Over the years, she had transformed her shape into a lady of the night and called out to various men, then tore off every last piece of their body when they came to her bed. The soldiers, ashamed their skill could not save them, shed bitter tears as they died and the spirit claimed they were the most delicious things she had ever tasted. The next spirit wriggled the others with a story of cunning and guile. One night, she threw a small boy into a bog. When his older sister came to rescue him, she too sank into the murk. Those two were followed by their parents, then other siblings, then extended relatives, until finally every member of the village was sleeping at the bottom of the bog. When the spirit finished her story, she was so beside herself with glee that she did not even notice the saliva that dripped down her chin. Nervously, the smallest spirit in the crowd stepped forward to address the crowd. I am the most amazing of us all, cried the oft ridiculed spirit at the top of her lungs, for it was I who trust all living creatures into terror's deepest depths. The other spirits, unable to contain their mirth, collapsed to the ground and rolled about and their laughter did not cease until the horrifying monster the small spirit had summoned from the demon world devoured each and every last one of them. Vile Axe A mage with a putrid soul imbued the essence of a fire lizard into this axe. The girl stares at the sight before her. Her father lies nearby, carved to pieces by countless blades. Her mother also lies dying, as well as her newborn baby brother. All had suffered terribly in her final moments, and the girl can do nothing but cry 
as she stares at the three soldiers who have murdered her only family. Three years later, the girl reappears, her visage made strong by her vow for revenge. The first soldier has grown so fat that the buttons on his uniform can barely contain his girth. The girl approaches him and claims to know an easy way to lose weight. On the pretext of an examination, she has him lie down on a bed before suddenly hacking off his arms and legs with an axe. The remaining lump of a soldier screams and attempts to wriggle away, but the girl pins him down and tells him he still has parts he can lose. Some time later, the girl sits in front of the now rounded torso and smiles. There we are, she whispers. Look how nice and slim you are. The second soldier is a peerless Otario. Each night, a new woman is invited to his manor to spend the night. The girl breaks into his home and kills the woman at his side, then uses her axe to hack off his manhood as he trembles and begs for mercy. The third soldier has long since left the service and is now living a quiet life with his family in a remote village. After they have fallen asleep, the girl takes her axe and cleaves the support beams of the house, causing it to collapse. She then sets fire to the wreckage, creating a great bonfire that can be seen from miles in all directions. Suddenly, the soldier's son crawls from the wreckage, covered from head to toe in terrible burns. As his eyes fall on the girl who has murdered his family, she hands him her axe and flees into the dark of night, never to be seen again. Dragoon Lance A spear that symbolizes a pact between a great warlord and an ancient dragon. He had grown old. The king's dauntless gaze had lost its light, and his toward body had grown soft. What's more, every ounce of fear and vanity he had gained with age now gnawed away at his heart. The king was afraid, so he repeatedly ordered the invasion of neighboring countries so as to hold onto the lands he had been sworn to protect. The king was afraid, so he tried to take everything through violence and oppression, for he no longer trusted his own advisors and vassals. There was a dragon that had sworn fealty to the king. This wingless creature would do anything the king commanded, for he had been saved by the king once, and was sworn to repay this debt with his very soul. Even if the king's orders were folly and madness, the dragon would follow them to the last, for his king was justice itself. One day, the dragon requested an audience with the king. He was covered in blood from his last victim, the king's own son, who the region had ordered the dragon to assassinate. The bloody dragon hung his head low and said, I cannot defy your orders, O king, but neither can I obey them any longer. I beg of you, kill me and grant me release. This is a tale of a foolish king and a wingless dragon in a nation that fell centuries ago. Even now, the wind blows ceaselessly across the grasslands. It blows just as it did on the day the king and the dragon made their pact. Faith A sword carried by the world's most loyal servant. Like that loyalty, the sword's blade is straight and true. There was once a famous poet in a land to the far, far east. Now in his twilight years, his ability had withered such that he could no longer craft a single stanza or verse. The poor poet spent every moment racked with sorrow for what had been lost. But one day, a monk appeared by his side, gently placed a blade in his hand, and imparted the following words. Kill one by this blade for one poem, and two for two in kind, the likes of which will be more splendid than any this world has ever heard. Clinging to the monk's words, the man waited for the cover of darkness and cut down a man he encountered by the roadside. The following day, he wrote a most beautiful poem, instantly reclaiming the fame and prosperity he had lost. The poet went on to kill two in succession. He killed one and wrote a poem, then killed again and wrote another, rising to almost dazzling levels of wealth and renown. But soon, he became obsessed with knowing how splendid a poem he might write if he were to kill someone precious to him. He killed his wife and wrote a poem. He killed his children and wrote a poem for each. He moved through the estates, killing everyone there, writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. Eventually, he killed so many passers-by that the poems could not keep up. He would kill and write, then kill and kill and kill and kill, until in the end he took his own life, no longer crafting poems at all. All that remained was a blade wet with blood. Spear of the Usurper A spear used by a prince's body double to slay his employer. The traitor was later killed with the same spear. In a far-off land, there was a man who acted as a double for a nation's prince. 
performing duties in his stead as was required. One day, having finished his work, he returned to the prince's chamber to find the princess laying naked in his bed. As the double stood in place dumbfounded, the man who shared his face sneered and invited him to join them. The double loved the prince's sister, and he felt that the princess, who would admire him as her brother, loved him as well. Indeed, she was the only thing that kept him going in an otherwise miserable job, for the prince was a most despicable man indeed. Eventually, it came to pass that a war was to be waged under the prince's command. The night before it was to begin, the prince took his double aside and promised him a night with his sister if he could bring him the head of the enemy general. And as the prince chuckled with delight, the double took up his spear and thrust it through the prince's gaping mouth. The war over, the prince made a queen of his sister and would inflict wounds upon his own face and throat, an act which would occur every time she called out to him using her brother's name. Before long, the prince was found dead, his face burned, and a spear thrust through his open mouth. The man's face, hideously burned, was the very picture of serenity. Rebirth A unique sword with round blade, legend holds that it robs the wielder of his life force. That's right, this here is the weapon that will be ending your life. Ah, uh, don't sweat it. There is nothing to worry about. It'll be a pain the likes of which you've never felt before. In fact, you won't even feel pain at first. It'll be more like water sliding across your skin. Honestly, for most folks, it ain't the pain that makes them scream. It's the sight of their own blood flowing out of them. Yeah, it won't end so easy. See this part of the blade right here? This part hurts like a real son of a bitch. It's my favorite, which is why I always save it for last. I like to use it after people's voices get too hoarse and you can't tell what they're saying, which is real... Fucking hell, are you ever loud? Mind piping down there? You're gonna make my hand slip. I won't kill you right away, so don't worry about a thing there, champ. I'm gonna take my sweet time before you finally give up the ghost. Honestly, you'd be surprised how much it takes to kill a person. I mean, think about it. People got two eyes, most of them anyway, and two ears, ten fingers, ten toes, twenty nails across the lot, and don't even get me started on joints, cause folks got a hundred of the damn things. Yeah, we got plenty of ways to keep ourselves entertained. Huh? Why I'm doing this? Now ain't that a question. Buddy, I'm just doing what you've been doing for a good long while now. Nabbing innocent citizens on fake chargers, torturing them, and putting their severed heads on display. That ring any bells, buddy? It should, because it was all you. Yes, maybe you forgot about all that, huh? Well, that's okay. I'll spend all the time it takes to make sure you remember every last thing you did to my wife and daughter. <laughs> Sunrise This spear's point is so finely honed that all grazed by it experience an instant painless death. In the distant past of a land known as the Golden Isle, there existed a sword crafted from every metal and precious gem in the land. So sharp was its edge that even the slightest cut would leave an unsealable wound that would eventually drain the victim of their blood and life. In a strange turn of fate, the sword eventually ended up in the hands of a destitute woman who sold her body to get by. The sword was as long as she was tall, and she could not wield it effectively, so she instead slid it between her sheets as a surprise for the men who used her. The sword was so sharp they felt no pain when cut, and soon died without even knowing what was happening. The woman would then help herself to their coin, causing her own purse to swell. Making use of her gains, the woman dressed most beautifully and soon had acquired every kind of metal and precious gem in the land. But it was not enough for her, so she decided to melt down the sword and obtain the gems contained within, a desire made manifest by the sword's beauty. Thus decided, the woman heaved the sword to her shoulders and made for the blacksmith. But on the way to the smith, the sheer weight of the sword caused the woman to lose her balance, and she fell from the bridge into the river below. So unshakable was the woman's greed that she could not bring herself to relinquish her grip upon it. The woman's pale and bloodless corpse was found washed up on the riverside the following day. Moonrise A weapon owned by a blind swordsman, the blade shines in the darkness, making the owner easy to spot. There is a legend of long ago that speaks of a nation threatened by a great inferno. This nation, however, was saved from eternal hellfire by a sword with the power to freeze anything. Around the sword stood thousands upon thousands of human eye sculptures. A man on a journey to seek out weapons eventually discovered a sword. 
He wrapped it in several layers of cloth and took it with him, placing it in the bag he carried upon his back. But before the man realized what was happening, the cloth, the sword, and his own body ended up frozen solid. A traveling shrine maiden eventually discovered the sword. She offered a prayer to her god and gripped the hilt, but cold instantly shot through her fingers and into her body, freezing her solid. In her final moments, the shrine maiden unleashed words of great blasphemy to the god who had failed her. An enslaved woman in a mine eventually discovered a sword. Desiring an easy death over the continuation of her daily suffering, she grasped the weapon firmly. And while the woman did not freeze, she was also unable to pierce her own flesh. Soon, moonlight shone upon the blade of the weapon, reflecting the sight of the woman being beaten and dragged away by her master. Lily Leaf Sword An arrow sword once owned by a woman of such impossible beauty that the men begged her to take their lives. I love him with all my heart, as he does me. When we cross paths outdoors, he sends signals with his eyes that only I can understand. He treasures my gifts so much, he keeps them locked away in a safe. Ah, oh, I couldn't ask for a better lover. I can't believe this. My best friend deceived the love of my life and stole him from me. One moment he was there, and the next he was gone. All that remains are some of my gifts, which are scattered across his empty room. Everything else of value has been sold at the village marketplace. This will not stand. He hasn't abandoned me. He is just being tricked by that woman. I know he still has feelings for me. He must. I am far more beautiful than she is and he knows it. Oh yes, he knows. But I must make him see the truth and quickly. I have to get her away from him. I have to kill her. Kill. Hurry up and kill. Consumed by her madness, the woman slaughtered the young husband and wife, hacking them with such force that the blade of her sword warped. The woman then went into hiding, leaving behind only clumps of unrecognizable meat and a sword with a horribly bent blade. But no matter how many smiths attempted to repair the sword, it never again retained its original shape. Captain's Holy Spear A spear brandished by a warrior monk chief who sacrificed his own life to protect his comrades. The captain tramples life under his feet. The screams of others transform into songs of joy. Flowing tears change from despair into darkness. Conflict beckons revenge and gives way to new solitude. Iron Will An enormous sword that grows heavier with every kill as blood and flesh cling to the blade. I raise the cry of my birth, the sound of heated iron taking shape, a steel mallet striking my form. Born to deliver karmic justice, I enter the world under the careful watch of spark and flame that give light to the gloom. I am a blade born of deafening roar. I am a weapon. I am iron will. I grant death. I transform the dread and screams of my foes to elation. I fasten my iron skin with their viscera. When I rob them of life, I am filled with dark joy. When I crush them beneath me, I find meaning in my birth and I continue to kill that I might share this delight with all. I kill and kill and kill and kill. I am a weapon. I am Iron Will. I am shattered. At battle and blood's end, my body is torn asunder by malice and hate. Today I again engage the Red Dragon in battle, and magical forces meet leaping iron fangs to create a blood storm. My steel cursed, I sink into the slumbering black. I am a weapon. I am Iron Will. I dream. It is a dream of a small butterfly. In it, the butterfly is caught in a light rain, struggling against it with all its might. In the darkest of nights, I behold a dream that will never come true. I am a weapon. I am Iron Will. Blade of Treachery When a man who has lost his way wields the sword, the blade becomes blunt as wood. The sisters were puppets of complex machinery. So fine was their construction that any who laid eyes upon them assumed they were human in every way. They were the embodiment of a man's greatest technological achievements. They walked like humans, ate like humans, laughed like humans. The one thing they could not do, however, was shed tears, for they were not designed in this way. Because the sisters were machines, they felt nothing. Oh, they might mourn as humans did, but they experienced no true sadness for they did not know what sadness was. Even when their friends perished in tragic accidents and their creator died of disease, they felt nothing. To the sisters, 
all it meant was that those people no longer existed. It was a warm spring day when a lone cat wandered into their home. It was a scrawny, filthy thing, riddled with disease. What a bother, the sisters thought as they looked down at the wretched creature. But they fed it milk, wiped it clean, and kept it warm, and soon the cat was well again. From that day forth, it would linger wherever the sisters were, brushing against their legs when he wanted food. If he caught a mouse, it would bring back to boast its prowess. If he wanted love, it would cry out to them in a melting voice. What a bother, the sisters thought. It was a cold winter's day when the cat came into their house, let out a feeble squeak, and died. Time and again did the younger sister shake the cat's body. Time and again did the elder sister call out to it, but the cat neither moved nor responded. In that moment, the sisters felt as though they felt something break deep inside their chests, and from that day forth, they truly felt nothing at all. The Devil Queen The favorite spear of a mad queen whose lust for power led her to kill all of her son's wives. This story takes place in a small country at around the same latitude as the northernmost member of a nation of city-states that are part of a region with a village that is attempting to establish a trade agreement with another village on a tiny island in the ocean south of a country that used to have an alliance with a republic next to a kingdom where a queen resided. He was asked by the owner of a shop frequented by a wet nurse who looked after the child born of an adulterous relationship by the wife of a master of a foolish servant who fell in love with a beautiful queen who appears in the poems of a minstrel who was loved by the country's king's wife's little brother's cousin big brother's son-in-law's foster child. Where does one store the throne that was supposed to be adorned with decorations crafted from the materials of the handle of the lid of a pot that is the same weight as tableware that is the same color as the weather vane on a neighboring house that can be seen from the peephole of a door in the reflection of a mirror with an ornamental frame decorated with silver carvings engraved with a fragment that was made when creating the whetstone that used to polish this kitchen knife? Oh my god! <laughs> The person who heard that question was the wife's husband, little sister's big brother, daughter's groom's little brother's nephew's father's mother's husband, bride's niece, father-in-law, wife's husband, little sister's big brother's daughter's groom's little brother, nephew, father's mother's. Bang of the twins, a giant, a cursed axe that was bathed in the blood of young twins before being presented to the gods themselves. We've been together since we were born. We're together when we eat, when we sleep, and when we dream. We share everything. We share the milk we get from mummy and the nice things daddy says to us. But we are not together when we die. Daddy took me and cut off my head, and mummy took my sister and cut off her head. But it's okay. Our blood got all mushed up into a big axe, so now we can be together forever. Ancient Overlord an ancient warlord used the sword to slay his loyal subjects in hope of gaining eternal life. There was once a royal sword passed down in a prodigious kingdom that had prospered for generations. It was said the crystal embedded upon it contained the great magic, and should it ever absorb the blood of ten thousand people, it would grow bright red and grant its wielder immortality. However, this kingdom's final ruler, known to the world as the High King, valued the continued prosperity of the kingdom he had inherited from his ancestors over any prospect of eternal life. One day, the queen, the king's dearest love, lost her life in a tragic accident. She was with child, and the tragedy occurred shortly before the babe was to be born. Distraught with grief upon hearing the news, the aged king found himself unable to accept the prospect of his royal bloodline dying with him. In an attempt to continue the kingdom's legacy by attaining a body without death, the now mad High King used the sword to cut down any and all subordinates or citizens unlucky enough to cross his path. If I am to be the final king, he was heard to cry, then the kingdom survives as long as I live. He killed his subjects by the dozens, the hundreds, the thousands, and with each life he stole, the crystal's light grew more radiant. But when the crystal was nearly full, the king's ailing heart proved unable to bear the burden and burst, killing him on the spot. Alas, had he just slain the pregnant woman and unborn child that were before his very eyes, he would have taken exactly 10,000 lives. <laughs>